Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options market across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. Hey, everyone. It's Dan here. If you like on the tape, you'll love trading spaces. Guy and I do it every Monday and Wednesday live on Twitter spaces. We break down the biggest market moving headlines of the day and take your questions. We're also joined by some pretty cool guests. So check it out. All you have to do is follow at underscore trading spaces on Twitter and sign up for our email reminders at riskreversal.com. That's every Monday and Wednesday live at 1 p.m. Eastern on Twitter. Brought to you by CME Group. Before we get into it, if you follow me on the Twitter, you may have noticed that I've been trolling. That's the word, right, Dan? Trolling Steve Cohen, the owner of the New York (laughs) Mets, because he is, listen, I fail at many things. He is failing at the Twitter. And Danny actually said to me earlier today that I don't hate the Mets. And I'm actually thinking about this. I actually hate Met fans. And that's very, <laughs> I mean, that's that's deep. Not me. Danny. That's you. That's No, no. I, I'm saying that's me. Because it's that, hard not to like that team. If the Met fans annoy you, I get it. But that team is hard not to root for. I mean, they're scrambling around blue collar guys, you know. It's easy for me to hate the Mets. But I understand what you're saying. D- Danny, you're deep on this one. It's I got very, deep on it. You're my therapist. I this. also tell Yankee fans that Jacob DeGrom, when he's healthy, and then listen, there's a lot to be said. He's a Hall of Famer probably anyway, but he's got to stay healthy. He's Mario Rivera for nine innings. Yeah. And I ask Yankee fans that, and some, uh, no, 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 and then they think about it like, you know what? The guy, he's he may be the best pitcher of our lifetime when he's healthy. I have said that the run that he'd be on prior to his injury is the best run a pitcher's had over that time period. 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 Maybe Bob Gibson, but that's as close as you No, get. put yeah. Gibson's numbers up. And I know Dan, see, Dan Nathan. Well, hold on. No, back, to, back, to, mean, back to trolling Steve Cohen. For those who don't know, one of the most successful hedge fund managers, let's say, of the last 30 years or so, he bought the Mets last year. And after being pretty supportive, a little rah-rah on the Twitter, right? You know, like kind of rallying the troops when their season started to take a little dip this summer. What did he tweet, Guy? The tweet is amazing. And I think that finally people who know him, just, you know, I started my career there. I don't think he knows my name. I sat 10 feet away from him for a year. But people who know him were like, Dickhead, oh, yeah. I think he called you. Yeah. That, the, the, like, that tweet is about right. Like, so that's how he's treated that's how all he tre- professionals. I will say around. he treats his first baseman like he does his portfolio manager. There you go. So, so that's here, consistent. here is the tweet. Steve Cohen, earlier this week, it's hard to understand how professional hitters can be this unproductive The best teams have a more disciplined approach. The slugging and OPS numbers don't lie. So your comment was trolling. What he was doing was subtweeting his own players. That's called a subtweet. By the way, you're listening to On the Tape with Dan Nathan, (laughs) Danny Moses, and me, Guy Adami. It's been another ridiculous week for the markets. We're watching stocks off their record highs. Commodities are getting slammed. And talk of the dreaded Fed taper, Dan Nathan. Later, we'll go off the tape with Mike Novogratz, founder and CEO of Galaxy Digital. But let's get started. Right now, the market is a bit of a triple threat it's facing right now. Anxiety over COVID, China. By the way, this stuff going on in China is legit. And Fed tapering, you know what? It's amazing. I actually thought at one point this week the market might be ready for that 10, 12, 15 percent correction. But it continues to sort of shrug things off. And I find myself flummoxed is a word I saw earlier on Twitter. I find myself a bit flummoxed here. The level of complacency when you talk about the markets, right? We see crude oil just getting annihilated. It's down about 15 or 16 percent from the highs that it made just in early July. We're seeing other industrial commodities do the same. Copper has had a big move. I mean, there's lots of risk assets out there that are saying something very different that I think the stock market with the S&P up 17 percent, about 1 percent from its all-time highs, and the NASDAQ, and then obviously the Russell 2000, Mm -hmm. the small caps are telling a very different story. But I guess, you know, Guy, you bring up passive investing, you know, bring up Tina, that's just a little trigger there. There is no alternative. It's a tale of two cities when it comes to markets here. I think investors are hesitant to take their money completely out of the market still, and I get it, because they think the Fed will probably change course if this tapering spooks people too much. Speaking of China... SoftBank's out there selling everything that's not nailed down. <laughs> I mean, you saw the deal this morning, DoorDash, you know, suddenly he has a great way of telegraphing things, obviously, into the marketplace. And that's a result, 
obviously of China, among some other privates potentially that are out there. That's been a big buyer of things that have been out there for a long time. And we've said this all along. I know the S&P will probably make new highs when this comes out tomorrow and the market will rebound. It's unhealthy. It's been unhealthy now for several weeks. And there are stocks that are getting obliterated, down 20, down 30, down 40 percent. And I'll go back to the comparison to 2000. And again, that's 21 years ago. And we're going to get Mike's thoughts on this later. 21 years ago, that's a generational of investors that didn't see what that feels like. When momentum ends, you don't buy a, a 40 PE stock at a 34 PE stock when it's going down. If it's a normal growth company, I'm saying, where's the bottom? So it's happening. But to Dan's point, he's been saying this all along, F MAGA, F you, F everyone. <laughs> it's been, it stayed in the market at this right. point. Well, but- here was a stat earlier in the week. And Liz Ann Saunders of Schwab put this out on Twitter. It was that 84% of the stocks in the S&P 500 were above their 200-day moving average, but only like 46% in the NASDAQ were above their 200-day moving average. So that kind of speaks to the, the weakening breadth that you have in the NASDAQ. I and mean, listen, we know that those top five or six names make up nearly 50% of the NASDAQ. 100. They make up 25% of the S&P 500, so less of an impact in the S&P 500, and there just seems to be greater breadth. We're seeing better rotations, I guess, in the S&P 500. You look at a day like Thursday here when the market was down a little bit. There was follow-through from Wednesday's decline, and you're seeing what led the way back. It was those massive tech names. So I actually don't think, guys, that that's that Robin Hood, Wall Street bets trader. I think that is, to your point, Guy, I think that is passive investing because they're always coming for those two major indices. The money just continues to flow in regardless. And I want to just sort of stay on China here because I find this fascinating. Alibaba is not a small company by any metric, even with the sell-off we've seen. And oh, by the way, this was a $319 stock on Halloween of last year. That's when Jack Ma sort of disappeared. We saw Alibaba this week trade with a 150 handle. I think it traded down to 159 and change. That is a staggering move that we've seen in a stock that still has a market cap of 450 or so billion dollars. And, you know, one of the things that I've said incorrectly so far, you know, I thought this weakness in these individual names and oh, by the way, the FXI, which is trading towards levels we haven't seen in a year and a half, was going to find its way into our broader market. And it hasn't. And I'm surprised by that. But maybe it speaks to exactly that passive investing rules today. I know we're going to talk about Robinhood later, but there was a point, there was a comment that they made on the conference call, which is about the third quarter account growth. It's going to be, quote, considerably lower. And they're actually citing the drop in revenue as a result of lack of volatility, which I don't think they know what volatility is because the stuff that they trade, and we'll talk about Doge, is volatile. But that's telling me the lack of account opening is we are nearing the end of kind of the retail growth. Robinhood had no question has had a huge impact on market levels, on market participation. If that's slowing, where's the next leg coming of buyers, the incremental buyer coming? I thought that was telling. Alibaba, you know, before 2021 was a stock that people had on their trillion dollar market cap radar. It was almost there. It's been cut in half now. And guy, you said it's about 450. And the fact that you can have a company, this is not something that's happened specific to their business. It was regulatory action, I think, as it started with, was it Ant Financial? And so I guess the question is, is something broader going on in China as it relates to their consumer and consumer demand? And I think back to August of 2015, I think it was this week in August 2015. Remember when the Chinese devalued their yuan? And remember the reverberations in almost every market around the world? So it is interesting that it seems fairly isolated to China right now, but is there, we've seen disappointing economic data out of China on numerous stats over the last couple of weeks. Is that likely to come to our shores? Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because it was August of 2015, six years ago, effectively, when China did devalue. And by February of the ensuing year, we saw an S&P cratering. I actually remember the day the market got crushed on that low tick. And I think it was 1806 or so in the s and I'm probably off, but I'm pretty close. That was a day that you had J.P. Morgan come out. Jamie Dimon came out and said he was actually personally buying his own stock. You had something coming out on the OPEC front, and you had some sort of debt offering that sort of took Deutsche Bank off the mat, and the market never looked back. But it was interesting. There was about five or six months 
prior to the market cratering where you saw that deval. We'll see. What I also found interesting, Dan, you like this group, uh, Widespread Panic. Is yeah. that- Athens, Georgia, baby. A- Athens, Georgia. By the way, REM from Athens, Georgia. Yeah. I mean, a lot of great bands have come. Danny Moses from, from Athens. Danny Moses, Athens, Georgia. Danny yep. Moses from Athens. That's right. I, didn't, I didn't know that. Yep. So yep. you learned something on the On The Tape you know, Just so you know, Guy, Widespread Panic was the last band that I saw before the pandemic at the Beacon Theater on February 28th, 2020. I mentioned Panic because... The city panic euphoria model uh, remains go. extraordinarily elevated, and it's warning of coming losses. Now, that city some sort of doubling down on a call they made earlier this month where I think they actually downgraded or went neutral on U.S. stocks. By the way, the same day that Goldman Sachs, I believe, put a $4,700 price point on the S&P. It's interesting that on the same day, Goldman Sachs went one way, city went the other. But I guess my point is city on to something. You know, Goldman thinks that rates are going lower in the 10 year and they said all the cash on the sidelines market going higher city said 10 year yields going to two percent and that's going to be headwinds for the market I, listen i'm in the city camp but i've been wrong danny moses both might happen neither are good. wow i like that neither are good by the way one tells you things are slowing down and the other tells you we have massive potential inflation that's runaway i don't think we're going to get runaway inflation because i believe over time the economy will slow enough we talked about stagflation before that will rectify itself and money will come out of equities. Where will it go? It will go into the asset, the most liquid asset in the world, U.S. Treasuries, where people believe they can run and hide, where people believe that the Fed will come back and end this tapering and not only buy $120 billion a month in loans and securities, buy $240 billion a month, Dan. Yeah, guys, they're not ending tapering. If they're going to start tapering, they're not ending it anytime soon. And I think really what it does is just kind of pushes off the coming off the, the ZERP, the zero interest rate policy. The first taper that went around several years ago, they said taper. Yeah. They started. then December they, 2013? They, yeah. And they paused it at some They point. paused it. Right. Yeah. I'm just saying, that I just think the market is, is trained that way now. That's yeah, but I, I think once you get some of that initial tantrum out of the way, you know, and maybe that's what we're having a bit of fits and starts right here. I, I just don't think the taper is going to be particularly impactful. It really speaks to when they start raising rates. They're definitely trying to condition the market this time. This flies in the face of sort of the October 2018 Jerome Powell, who just walked up on stage and seemingly out of nowhere said, oh, by the way, we're going to have a systematic reduction of our balance sheet and went on autopilot in terms of rate hikes. And the market obviously didn't like that. Why, Dan Nathan? Because the market went down 19.9%. I'm going to tell you right now, Powell is scared. Yeah, he, he should be. And he, and he, he, and he honestly, be. I think he's going to come across a Jackson Hole is, I have no idea what's going to happen here. I really believe he's got, not going to exude confidence in that call. I think he's going to 52 48 it, as we used to say. So here's the thing. What would be the problem? Let's just say hypothetically they, they guide to $10 billion less a meeting or whatever a month, however they do it. And let's say the stock market came in, you know, five, six, seven percent or something. like That's like a garden variety here's a sell-off. What would it matter? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, what, Really, what would it matter? Here's the problem. The problem is that if rates actually do move higher and the cost of fund the U.S. government moves higher fiscally, it's a problem. So it, there's two separate issues here. So we're about to pass this infrastructure bill, maybe if Congress ever gets together again. We're about to you know, do all these things that cost money. And again, we talked about the debt. It's very high. So financing that debt, that can compound on itself. I'm probably getting ahead no, of it. No, I, I actually, that's, we've talked about that for months. I, I don't think rates are going, you know, when, when Jerome Powell had to do an about face in 2018 because the stock market sold off 19.9%. Thank you, Dan. Me, Thank you. What did they do? They changed their tune. But I just don't think, uh, the 10-year treasury, what, got to 3.2%. I mean, here we are, 1.2%. To your point, Danny, the flight to quality in the U.S. treasuries is kind of counteracting a little bit what they might want to do to kind of combat any rise in prices. We like to look at single stocks from time to time. And earlier this week, we heard from NVIDIA, who I still submit, despite valuation, I mean, whatever metric you want to look at, NVIDIA is expensive. But they put out a pretty great quarter, in my opinion. Margins continue to seemingly improve. I mean, I thought just in terms of single stock, that's interesting. I will say that's a name that needs to close above 210 to take the next leg higher It's going to be interesting to see what happens over the coming weeks. What I think is fascinating about NVIDIA is that here's a name like five years ago, I think a lot of investors might have thought was like a niche semiconductor company. It was five years ago. And now it has a half a trillion dollar market cap, and it's trading at about 17 times next year's expected sales. And that, that is truly astounding, especially in a group for the most part that trades below a market multiple, if you look at many of their peers. And so to me, that's the one thing. And I think this is where in a raging bull 
market, who gives a crap about valuation, right? Like it just doesn't matter. In hindsight, people are like, oh, well, it was trading 43 times earnings and 17 times the out year. Here's the thing I think you have to focus on. Fiscal 2023, that's next year. Consensus estimates is calling for about an 11%, 12% increase in EPS and about a 12% increase in sales. So if that actually ends up being correct, then this is a very, very, very expensive stock. Now, obviously, data center and gaming are two of their biggest areas of growth, and those were fantastic during the pandemic. But the only thing, listen, what I try to do here is the stock's up 50% of the year. I'm going to say you go and buy a a half a trillion dollar market cap semiconductor trading at a crazy multiple? No. But I think I bring it up, and Dan, Dan, I'm interested in your thoughts. You're a baseball fan. We talked about the Mets earlier. Baseball, Ray. (laughs) Go ahead. No, do that again. (laughs) Baseball. You had a gun pointed at me. Go ahead. What's that from? That's so good. <laughs> that's Field of Dreams. I that's mean, right. That's unbelievable. That's right. That's, that's right. Such, and it's topical because obviously we saw the Yankees. Unfortunately, do you do Darth lose. Vader too? You must. Of course. Let me hear that. Now I'm gonna do. I'll do that when we talk about actor. Tesla. Okay, for okay, go ahead. No, I, I I bring up I bring up Nvidia and I bring up baseball because Intel got caught napping. They got picked off first base, and the world is absolutely passing by. And it's you know it's interesting. A lot of people say these huge companies can't turn the boat around. Well. Microsoft figured it out. I mean, they did an amazing 180, in my opinion. So Intel just sort of got caught napping, in my opinion, and they've opened the door to two companies, AMD on one side and NVIDIA on the other, and Intel sort of been left for dead. Do you think that these companies, you know, they have to adapt, and they are big companies, but the world's changing very quickly. It's really fascinating what you said about Intel. I mean, Intel in the 2000s, they missed mobile. They missed mobile, about and that. it was right in front of them. And so when you think about where they were as far as computers, computing, I guess you would call it. Listen, you know, Microsoft, people were very skeptical. Even after Satya took over, they were like, ah, they're taking these things that they used to charge a licensing fee, and now they're kind of streaming it, and you're going to pay a recurring thing. Well, they were clearly ahead of the curve, and you have to give Benny off over there at Salesforce. And those guys have been able to command these crazy valuations, and that's why Microsoft grew into that valuation. People love recurring revenue it's like your recurring revenue is the you know it's number well that's why ibm yeah. used to get such a premium multiple because they had that recurring and then that went well that's another story for another day but you're ray can sell a field of dreams thing i'm digging it but you, you know actually- what you are moonlight graham because you would give every as dan asked last week would you trade everything just for that one moment the guy left his life just so he could take one at bat, took a walk, went to first base, and then went into the bushes. Look at and you. That was it. I actually think he hit a sack fly is is what I think he did in that at bat in the Field of Dreams game. But whatever. All oh, right. It didn't count as an at bat. You're probably right. Uh, whatever. It doesn't into the matter. Bushes but, but I yeah. would be also the guy that I would leave the field to go help that little girl cough up the hot dog. Right. Here's another question yeah, for you. Yeah. Did it did Walmart cough up the hot dog? Because we talked about Walmart a couple of weeks ago. I thought, listen, I thought it was another strong quarter, but the market's not rewarding. Oh, them yes, for it whatever is. Reason. It actually is. You it, think that, so? First of all, they pay the dividend and it went ex dividend. Not that it's big, but it's it's enough to, you know, notice charts in breakout mode, I think. You know, it's not a sexy play, but as it relates to Amazon, I've said before, Walmart already had the infrastructure that Amazon's been trying to build. Noted by Amazon's announcement today and or article in the journal that they're rumored to be opening up retail stores everywhere. So Amazon has effectively been out of space in their fulfillment by Amazon. Walmart's building Walmart Fulfillment Services, but they have a much more natural feed here. So they're getting more into tech we talked about before. The multiple's going to start to expand. I don't think the two converge necessarily. But you're seeing it now. Yeah, I got to tell you this, because I'm sure we mentioned it on the podcast in July. When Amazon broke out above its September 2020 high, it was about 3550 or something. It had been in this range. It had been trading between like 3550 and as low as 2900 since last September. And when it broke out prior to its earnings, you're like, oh, the smart money. You know, they know this is it. And a new range. The fact that this has been down 15% from those highs, giving back you know hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap, and you could say, ah, it was a bad quarter of bad guidance. They've had that before. Let's extrapolate. Look at Apple just made a new all-time high yesterday. Google, Alphabet has been doing the same thing. Microsoft today making a new all-time high. If you don't think that these stocks can sell off 10, 15, 20%, go back to last September, 2020, when the S&P and the NASDAQ each sold off about 10% and Apple and Amazon each sold off 20%. I think the level of complacency right here, the fact that you are staring at this Amazon chart and you see that decline on fundamental news and you are not worried about similar sort of names, very crowded names, it seems very odd to me.
We heard from Robin Hood as a publicly traded company. Their first earnings report, watch what I'm doing here, dropped earlier this week. And again, I mean, this is basically a crypto company. I know, Danny, you have some thoughts on this one. But I actually said on Fast Money after the report came out, I'm like, look, I don't particularly get it. But what I do get is this. Their account size will continue to grow as their client becomes more wealthy and they're going to get more clients. So just on the back of that alone, you might think it's a casino and a gambling app, and maybe it is, but that might be okay, Dan. Yeah, the assumption, though, that those clients, as their balances grow, might not leave and go to another institution that maybe offers more services. I mean, you know, we were talking about it yesterday as those numbers were coming out. I mean, if I were putting this app in a folder on my iPhone, it would be placed in the folder with DraftKings, Coinbase, I, FanDuel. I mean, I, it really would be. What my, my point is, is like it really is an entertainment and it's a gambling app. It is, as you said from the outset, it is a crypto company. So right. more than half of the trading fees came from crypto, right? So what was surprising? Nothing in the quarter. We already knew what the revenues were going to be. They filed it right before they went public. They had to give an update on second quarter. But you're telling me that 62% of all the crypto trading was Dogecoin. So no, Dan. They're not building wealth for the future or growing accounts. I think they're now have put themselves out there massively at risk and go back to the payment for order flow. Point for order flow, whether it gets shut down, regulated, or not, it can only go one way. It can't get better for them. So congratulations on the stock-based comp, on the charge in the quarter. Congratulations. But this stock has no no reason being where it is trading right now, in my opinion. I'm not sure it, but there's no reason being there. But it's going to be who knows, probably 55 tomorrow. And some yeah, it goes back to what the innovation was here. People talk about democratizing access to the markets. Fine. I mean, I don't really think that's innovative. I'm um, really what was innovative. And Danny, I think you've mentioned this on a couple of occasions is that they took trading to zero basically. And they forced the whole industry to do that. But if you look at some of these huge companies that they're trying to take market share from their trading revenue is not even a big deal. They have trillions of dollars in balances. You know, they have tens of millions of accounts. They have other ways of kind of making money off those people. So $5 trades didn't really matter. So I'm just not sure what the innovation is. I would say this, if you want to focus on crypto, obviously Coinbase here, this is a huge competitive issue for them. And and let me tell you this, if the biggest pillar of the bear case for Coinbase is their fees right now, then Robinhood has the potential to take market share from them by just crushing fees. And so that would be something that I'd really want to pay attention to. The existential risk to Robinhood is exactly what you mentioned before. If this payment for order flow goes away, that's it. Game's over. I just don't think it's going away. So I think Robin Hood can grow. Well, who's in this bothered world? by it, Danny? I'm going to ask you. This. Oh, who, I don't. Let's do a separate episode no, no, on that. I, what? Who's no, bothered by no, it? No, no. But right now, the, the customers don't really because they, they don't know care. what they don't know. Right. But yes, ah. they don't know what they don't know, okay. and it's not. They're, they're trading in dark, not lit market. Do, do you do you think that the regulatory issue, like this, is a huge issue for them? It's going to be something that's going to be dogging them as long as they primarily make their. Income Let me just say this: we're in a bull market still, as yeah. bearish yeah. as the way it feels. No one cares about any of this shit until the market goes down. It's when the market goes down and people want a scapegoat, then you'll get it. So you're not going to get anything while the market's up. Don't yell at me. I'm just just upset. You know what Danny should do? We should do this. We should do an on the tape backslash big short ETF. And we should basically, wow. with, that's a great that's idea. That's an easy segue you just made into. Oh, really? Well, Kathy Wood, Michael Burry. Well, oh, there it, it is. There Look it Danny is. Nice Check it out. Dan Nathan. Nathan. That's a bit of a natural segue here because earlier this week, Michael Burry, Michael, see what I did there? See the way I, it's diction is very important. See the way I enunciate my words? Well, he came out and talked about buying options, put options on Kathy Wood's ARC ETF. Basically, look, it's another way to be short Tesla. I think we all understand that. But it was interesting because then Kathy Wood was on the CNBC earlier this week. So, Danny, you have some background. With I will Mr. tell you Murray. this. M- Michael Burry doesn't just randomly trade things. Agreed. He does his work. A- and so 100% to agreed. say it's just Tesla, I, I know I know you're saying that, but he's looked at it. He's looked at all these small cap names that are in there, which he owns 30% of. He knows that's not sustainable. He sees the way that you know she probably comes up with her thought process and her modeling, and he doesn't agree with it. So he figures, that's the best ETF I could short. Why would I buy calls on the VIX or, or puts on the Qs? I'll just short Kathy Wood because they think her process is flawed. So they didn't get into it directly. And I, have, by the way, I haven't talked to Michael Burry in probably two years. We email every once in a while. I'm begging him, if you're out there, Michael, to come on the podcast here. I'd love to get you, Stephen Porter and Vinny in here. But her answer to him was, I think he was good at what he did back then, but he doesn't understand innovation. Well, you know what he did understand? Innovation in the bond market. And he went after and he slaughtered it. 
right? He wouldn't have just slaughtered. And to his credit, Michael Burry is one of these guys who will always be early and most of the time right. And to be able to stay in that trade, the guy was talking about water rights and water shortage 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, he, the guy's a deep thinker. Do you think it's interesting that this ARC Innovation ETF is down 7% on the year? It's down 30% from its highs. And I think one of you guys just said that this might be another way to short Tesla. And it really isn't. If you think about it, Tesla's about 10% of the weight. There's Teladoc. That thing is down a lot from its highs. That's the second largest holding. Tesla is obviously down a lot. Roku is up a lot. Coinbase down a lot from its highs. Unity Software, recent IPO, down from its highs. Zoom down from its highs. I mean, they're going after big names. I mean, this is kind of like some whale hunting that's already, they're already been wounded a little bit here. Yeah. Like, you know, again, I'm sure there's names in there that he probably wouldn't be single name short. I don't want to speak for him, but I think on the whole, I think if you keep going down that list, you'll find very illiquid names, right, that are in there. This is a significant bet. I mean, he bought 2,355 puts against that ETF. I mean, that's not just pedestrian stuff here. And it's interesting because then Kathy Wood obviously tweeted because that's what people do in today's world. I'm quoting, I do not believe that he, Michael Burry, understands the fundamentals that are creating explosive growth and investment opportunities in the innovation space. He definitely understands the investment opportunity, and that opportunity is to short this ETF. So, uh, listen, I, it, we'll see how this plays out. I, I think everyone would agree that that portfolio doesn't have tons of upside. The chart looks absolutely horrendous. Thank you, Dan, for flashing that to me. I don't even need to be a technician to tell you that that doesn't Yeah, it look just good. broke the uptrend that had been in place from the May lows. And, and granted, it did go from like $98 to 130 to its recent highs in July. It just broke that uptrend. It's been in a downtrend. Its all-time high was up there at 160 back in February. That was when Tesla was at its all-time highs. So, you know, again, listen, I think what Kathy does, she's really transparent. She comes on TV. She tweets. They put out their annual innovative reports. They're quarterly reports. I mean, she's saying, you know, you want to short it, short it. They have puts on the thing. She knew what she was opening herself up. Listen, to. the one thing about Kathy Wood, I, I, I think that she believes what she says. And so you can't take that away from her. Danny, in terms of Tesla, now you got the government once again investigating. Is Tesla going to be sort of as Tesla goes, will the market go? I do think that if you told me without telling me where Tesla was, that the S&P was down 30 percent from whatever, I will tell you that Tesla's down more than that. I don't know when that's going to happen, but I'm saying it will be, I believe, the stock that represents everything in this market that is wrong with valuation, wrong with corporate governance, wrong with euphoria. It has everything. Just listen, there's a lot of companies like that, but this happens to be the biggest one that size. And I will tell you this, maybe the SEC can stop letting firms like Hindenburg Research do their work for them. Look what Hindenburg Research has uncovered. They got the Nikola. They got the Lordstown Hindenburg, right? And it's from their reports and Clover. It's their reports that the SEC started to look into things. Well, there's been a lot of reports written on Tesla. And I believe that the SEC, we've said this before, doesn't want to be responsible or blamed for taking a stock down. So letting things take its course. Now, now you have an NHTSA, you know, investigation into autopilot. Now you have two senators calling for the FTC to scrutinize the fees, the Federal Trade Commission. Yes, you sold a product to a consumer that does not work. You've been charging the consumer for a product that does not work. Not only does it not work, it can kill you. So those are that's a bad parlay right there. So to Danny's point about Tesla being down, you know, versus the S and P or that sort of if thing. If that were to happen. Yeah, so 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 Tesla was already ripping in the start of twenty twenty, pre pandemic, got up to two hundred and then got as low as seventy. And then by the end of the year, it was trading I don't know, near four hundred dollars. It traded almost nine hundred dollars earlier this year. Here we are at six seventy four. Draw a line from the low in March of 2020 and connect all the dots all the way to where it is right now. And you have a massive uptrend that it is sitting right on here. Um, we need Carter Worth to give us a quick uh, Carter Braxton update. I love Carter Braxton Worth. So it's interesting. So I have my Tahoe. Okay. It's a 2001 Tahoe. It's got, it is quarter of a million miles. And my wife has been on me for a while to sell the car. And when those used car numbers came out a while back, I'm like, here's my opportunity. I'm going to say this. It makes me feel bad, but here's my opportunity to flee somebody. Somebody out there is looking for a 20 year old Tahoe with a quarter of a million miles. So I put it up for sale and maybe my price is too high, but I bring up used cars, Danny, because we are now going to do a little segment we call the rot, the Danny Moses rip off the tape in the used car world. The mic is yours. Oh, like people will come, Ray. They'll come to short these stocks for reasons they can't even fathom. <laughs> that is, that anyway, is so good. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, maybe we should get James Earl Jones. Oh, he's the best, the my best. favorite of all anyway, time. Please. Anyway, so there's something called the Mannheim for those people out there. It's an, Wait a second. Yes. 
you knew I was going to do this. Yeah. Is that Mannheim as in Lou Mannheim? <laughs> and Wall Man Street. looks in the abyss. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, that is yeah. one of the great. Oh, I love that. But the I like looks you. In, yeah. yeah. I, uh, any anyway, go ahead. It might as well be because. The Lou Mannheim yeah, Index. Yeah, the Lou Mannheim Index. So it comes out monthly. It measures used cars, values that are out there. They've been kind of slacking off here the last couple months. Why do I mention that? We talked a couple weeks ago just about these stocks in general, how their trading looks cheap on this year's PE but looks very expensive if you go to the out years. But the source of a lot of income for a lot of these used car companies is the securitization market. What does that mean? They make loans to Guy Adami on the lot to go buy a 1999 Dodge something, and the car is you know $17,000. It was thirteen, dollars but that's fine because it'll extend you a loan. They'll make it a seven-year loan instead of a five-year loan, which is another problem going on. Extended duration, never good, and they get you into the car. They do the securitization. They, they, they do the loan. They package it into securitization. It goes into the market. Well, We saw in the 2008 financial crisis, nine, what happened? The government had to bail out the entire auto securitization market with the TALF, the term asset back loan facility that happened, right? And again, back to the moral hazard thing, what's been happening? Let's look at a couple examples of some companies that reported recently. Look at America's Car Mart, Dan, on your your Bloomberg there. CRMT, right? They're used car dealership, basically, and they do financing on the spot. The stock got hammered. Why? Ironically, the prices are so high now that they're offering loans that are so long in duration that the monthly payments aren't enough from a margin perspective. They can make money. So that's an issue. But I want to talk about Carvana here a second. And I just think it's worthwhile. I don't think people, again, go back 20 years ago, didn't know, 12 years, don't even know about the securitization market and backing up. People know about mortgages that get securitized. People know about student loans that get securitized. Well, auto is a one and a half trillion dollar market of securitizations. Anyway, The performance is peaked in subprime. I would say used car market for securitization, subprime in particular. People are buying cars. Think about this. Five, seven-year loans. Guy, give me your attention here. I'm with you. Seven-year loans. I'm paying attention. What if they default on these? Which, by the way, they default. That's what this market is for. What if they start defaulting on them? Who owns that car? Where does that go? Guess where it goes. Goes back into the trust or the bank that owns it at a valuation that never made sense. So pickup trucks have dropped in the last month. That's kind of the first sign for me of what happened. I'll associate that with the home builder survey, which has been dropping also. I associate pickup trucks and building and construction kind of together. But Carvana sold in the first half of 2021 $3.1 billion of loans into securitizations, right? That's up 100% year over year. Good for them. These used car companies are supposed to, by definition, since the financial crisis, maintain 5% ownership of the securitizations of which they create. They normally own the bottom piece of same with same that happened in the housing market. Why these mortgage companies, they offload it and they grew on the balance sheet. So I know this is getting a little bit, maybe too granular. Here, I'm but, taking it, but they have an affiliated company that's basically run by the CEO's father that services the loans for him. And what does Carvana do? They don't keep 5%. They go out and buy 5% of the securitization itself. Again, I'm getting technical in nature. There was an article written in the wall street journal I'll tweet it out. Just go read about it. I'm not even sure Carvana right now because of other fish to fry. But it is going to be the poster child for what I believe is the used car market and the used car financing market. And listen, CarMax is a great company, great business model. AutoNation, great company. But earnings as a percentage of earnings for all these companies, the securitization market has provided a massive boost that is not sustainable, especially if used car prices go down. Last thing, Guy, when you drive a car off a lot, unless it's a you know, one of your vintage 100 Ferraris that are made, it's down 30% when you drive it off. Imagine a used car driving off of a lot. Sorry, that's it. I'm done with that. <laughs> well, it. I will tell you this about Carvana. They, their sales for 2021 are supposed to be up 110% year over year, so about $5.6 billion in 2020, which was also up 42%, so to nearly $12 billion this year. They're still losing money. Yeah. They're still losing money. They're making only money. They're making money only because of securitization. They have that's a $56 it. billion dollar market cap, and we've done a little would you rather on fast money. I've, I've fast pitched guy auto nation on a relative basis to carvana because to me they're doing 50 percent of their sales and they're primarily new cars online and if carvana has that valuation for the reasons that people don't know which is what you're just telling us is because they have this online model that supposedly is the new way to buy cars it doesn't make sense. listen they had that i want to say one other thing this, this relates i always say not dot your i's and cross your t's read your q's and k's your 10q comes out like quarterly it. your 10k comes out annually Grant Thornton is the auditor for Carvana. They actually said, and they're not accusing them of anything, but they said on the audit, it says this issue of the securitization for them is a, quote, critical audit matter in 2019 and 2020. I'm sure it's going to be a continued. But again, 
Someone will write a short report, and the SEC might start paying attention. But you know when they won't pay attention? Not when the stock's at 350, when it's at 125. That's right. SEC opens up investigation. And it's interesting. Anyway. I mean, that stock, Carvana, went from 60, I think, at its low in March of 2020. It just traded up to 375 or some crazy thing. And it does. Dan mentioned the market cap. It's significant. I will say this. The other things you mentioned, 10 Qs and all those things and blah, blah, blah. I don't, I don't read any of that stuff. I read the sports page. But... 13 Fs came out. And yes. Third point. You're a fan of the third point, yeah, right? Yeah, of course. They liquidated their 400,000 share position in Carvana. Just something to put out there if you're playing our home game. But I appreciate what you did there, Danny. One Brown. last thing. Please. Carvana's market cap is greater than Ford. And I know that we used to play that t- that game a lot yeah. with Tesla and Ford and GM or whatever. It didn't work out too well. But that doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. Well, you know, again, they don't, like Ford and GM, they service their loans, right? Yeah. They keep them on balance sheet. They don't take gain on sale. They, they don't sell those things up front and do that. They sell the car, yeah. right? That got them into trouble back in the financial crisis. But anyway, I think people believe, ah, Auto securitization market, they'll get bailed out. Here you comes said the, the government. Total, just, to, just to wrap this up, though, Danny, the total auto securitization market. One and a half trillion. Somewhere around one and a half trillion, I believe. Don't at me if that's not which right, is, but it's somewhere. Which but, is no. about the same as the school loans. Yeah. And, well, that's a but, big, but, those are but so back, Going back to the financial crisis, I mean, those were some of the canaries in the coal mine. Weren't we seeing subprime defaults in autos that led to that? And then once you have one domino fall, they all kind of work together. Well, it's funny. You, people pay their car first. Yeah. So if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you have a job. You pay your car before you pay your rent. And so I think part of this obviously was stimmy checks going and people going out and like buying cars. But checks. it is not sustainable. It's used cars, guys. Wake up. You, do, you don't think a 2014 Chrysler with 40,000 miles on it? It's going down in value the more miles you put on it. So there'll be people stuck with this, but it's going to be again in the loan market. It won't be a devastating deal, but to the companies that – have these things on balance sheet. All right, let's make a market on Guy Dami's 2001 Chevy Tahoe. Yeah, please. Wait, wait, I, I think I'm three at five. That's a good market. Is that I a actually, good market? I put it out for like seventy four ninety nine. figuring somebody out there. On would, Carvana? On, on Facebook sales. What, like a What's Facebook the question? I forgot the question. How no, much is my car? Much we're making a market on his sale. 2001 Tahoe. My, my son had a pickup truck. All right, he's a general contractor. He's young. He's a student, but he has a GC. Like he's a GC. So I begged him. I made him buy his own car, pickup truck. A month ago, I said, Sell it. He goes, you made me sell Bitcoin at 100 bucks. I'm, like, uh, I'm telling you, I got this one right. Trust me. I probably got it right. He could sold it for $57,000. What? Yeah. Ford, whatever, the Dodge Ram 2500. I don't even know what the thing I, was. I, but for what he paid for it 18 months ago. What do you think Ray Liotta drives? I mentioned Ray Liotta because people don't realize he was in Field of Oh, are you kidding me? He was Amazing. Shoeless Joe. Any movie. Well, I shouldn't say Jesus any. But mo- look at you. I love when you do that. Ray Liotta movies are great. Great. I agree. I love Ray Liotta. <laughs> We share the same birthday, by the way, yeah. if anybody's playing our home game. And just to sort of tie a bow. Thank you. To tie a bow on this entire thing, as we sit here today, you know, we can wax poetic all we want, but the market, for whatever reason, doesn't see all this shit we just talked about for the last 40 minutes. The market just doesn't seem to care about. It'll be interesting to see if Novo, that would be Mike Novogratz, cares. And when we come back, we're going to have Mike Novogratz join us on the tape. With CME Group Micro Futures and Options, you can get the same access and capital efficiencies of our standard contracts with less upfront financial commitment. Diversify your portfolio and add flexibility by trading CME Group Micro Contracts in precious metals, FX, energy, and equity indices. Learn more about what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com backslash micros. Mike Novogratz is the founder, CEO, and chairman of Galaxy Digital, a financial services and investment management company in the digital asset, crypto, and blockchain technology sectors. He's one of the earliest and most active investors in the crypto space, first buying Bitcoin back in 2013. Mike was formerly a partner and president of Fortress Investment Group and spent more than a decade at Goldman Sachs. He served on the New York Federal Reserve's Investment Advisory Committee from 2012 to 2015 and was a helicopter pilot in the United States Army. Mike, welcome to On the Tape. As you know, we probably coincided our careers at Goldman Sachs. You were far more successful than I, but I was a fan of yours long before we met, so it's a real honor to have you here. I know 
guy, both Dan and Danny have some macro questions, but I just want to start this way. You come from an amazing family. Your father was a West Point guy. I think he won the Newt Rockne Award. New York Post just uh, wrote an article about your family, comparing it to the Kennedys. The similarities are obvious, but the one thing that sticks out to me is you're not from a family of wealth. You're from a basically an army family, guys and gals that really had to do things on their own. Can you speak to your upbringing, your father, all those things that got you where you are today? Yeah, listen, you know, I had a great family. I have a great family. We're a big tribe. You know, we grew up middle class. My mother was very aspirational. It was kind of a joke they wrote that article because I always kidded my mother that she wanted us to be like the Kennedys. I mean, she named my daughter or my first sister, Jacqueline, my brother, Robert. I've got a brother, John John. You know, she got married in 1960. And so... There was a little bit of family joking about it, but my mom was very aspirational. She, in a very positive way, just always told us we could do whatever we wanted to do. And growing up without stuff makes you commercial. When we would complain that the other kids have really fancy tennis shoes and we had the crappy Converse uh, or, or worse, my mother would be like, and you think you need Converse to be cool? I mean, do you think you need Nikes to be cool? And so I give a lot of credit to my mother. My father was a big, strong, silent type. Because he was a great football player, you know, he was kind of revered in our, from the boys in our family. We call him the big man. He's a giant guy. But he was a really kind of moral compass of the family. Didn't talk nearly as much as my mother. And so, listen, I think big families are rare today, but they're great because when you do really well, your brothers and sisters will tear you down. (laughs) And when you do really poorly, they'll pick you up. And so you never get too big for your britches. But you have a support structure that catches you when you screw up. All right, Mike. So Guy and I got to know you back in 2017. You were coming on CNBC a lot, but you weren't talking about traditional macro assets. You were talking about crypto. Let's go in a time machine. Let's go before that. Let's go before crypto. You made your bones in this business trading macro. We're in a pretty funky macro environment right now. X crypto give us a take on what you think is going on right now. Yeah, listen, we're in one of the most complicated and exciting markets any of us have ever been in. It's complicated because we are running a fiscal monetary experiment that I think we all know how it ends. Not well, right? You can't run deficits of this magnitude forever. The combination of central bank and treasury department or ministry of finance, you're not the United States, you know, that combo always has had some mission to try to guide economies. And we had this idea of independent central banks. That was what every one of us grew up with. Paul Volcker as kind of our first central banker for most of us on this call. And anyone listening is probably younger than the rest of us. (laughs) And so all of a sudden we have a central banker who's running treasury. Like just the metaphor of that is crazy. Like who thought that was a great idea? And I'm not taking shots at Janet Yellen, but she ran the central bank. She regulated his central bank and now she's at treasury. And so this idea of independent central banking just got thrown in the toilet. And we now have a central bank that's monetizing the treasury debt. That's a dangerous, dangerous position to be in. There is a small landing strip for the plane to land. Can we run the economy hot enough and drive inflation to three, three and a quarter percent, but not accelerate from there so we can monetize this giant, giant deficit, all this debt we have, and slowly devalue the dollar and land the plane gently without either the market collapsing into deflation or accelerating into inflation. After the 2012 crises, Ray Dalio wrote this great paper on uh, the 2009 crises on a beautiful deleveraging, how you can slowly deleverage yourself out and get into a healthy economy again. It was possible, I think, after 2012, but after both Trump's tax cut and then COVID and the response and with the political situation we have today, where Biden just wants to spend more and more because he feels it imperative to, right? We have the rich poor gap as wide as it's ever been. And so there's not a Tea Party that's saying don't spend money. There's a progressive party that's saying you're not spending enough. So you add it all together. It feels like the chance of us landing that plane is really, really slim. And so what do people do? They buy hard assets. So real estate is going to continue to go higher. 
You should borrow long term and buy real estate in good neighborhoods. It's the simplest trade I see out there. Yeah. You know, Mike, one of the things I've said, first of all, I, I just want to be on record saying this once again. I think some of the biggest villains of the 21st century are going to be central bankers. Full stop. That's my opinion that I'm entitled to. But I believe they are at the core of this wealth inequality, this wealth gap, which has never been wider in this country. Are you on board with that or am I way over my skis on no, this? No, listen, I think they're part of it. The wealth gap shows for a couple of reasons. One is central bankers are inflating assets and make it really simple. Five of us live on an island and I have the most coconuts and you guys have only one coconut each. And there are a thousand people with no coconuts and they all have $10 each and someone gives them $1,000 each. Listen, the price of coconuts goes way up. And since I have the most coconuts, I become much richer than everyone else. Like that's what's happening. Whoever has the most assets is getting much richer because assets are all going up. And so you're exacerbating the, and calcifying really the social strata that we have. Like the rich who have assets just keep getting richer. But there's more to it, right? We have a... Earnings is percent of the S&P at all-time highs. 30 years ago, before the baby boomers got into power, that number was about 5 or 6%. Now it's like 14 15%. That 10% difference in earnings came right out of labor. And so we have had this slow creep where labor has just taken it in the, in the midsection. It's been justified by boards and CEOs as, well, I'm very important. And, I'm, and it, it, that's an ethical and a moral decision people made. And so you've got these two forces working. It's moved slowly, right? The gap between rich and poor has moved slowly. How CEOs get paid have moved slowly. And so you're only looking to your left or to your right. And if you step back and look at the big picture, like we've completely screwed this up. And and we're seeing it shift now. Finally, people are screaming. The first part of the stimulus when, you know, between unemployment insurance and the the stimulus checks, it got to the point where, people were making about 50000 a year, right? About a $25 an hour. That was kind of what the government was giving you. And lo and behold, the people that were on the bottom of the pyramid said, this feels about normal, fair. For the first time in my life, I can breathe. And I think one reason we're seeing people not want to go back to work at fast food restaurants or the big box retail, uh, why McDonald's is having to pay bonuses is because people got used to this, hey, 50000 you know, $25 an hour should be the minimum wage. And it'll be interesting because I think that's sticking a little bit. And so we might have the first wage inflation in America that we've had in a long time. But I think that inequality thing is an unbelievably important question because it's defining our the last 30 years. So, Mike, let's, let's stick with that wage inflation. I know you mentioned that asset values are up. The Fed's pushing everyone out on the risk curve. They're hoping that inflation can stay, stay tame, obviously. But wage inflation is the real measure of inflation, in my opinion. I just get your thoughts on that. And I know how you feel about the Fed, but if you think like they're pretty far behind on that and what that may mean for corporate earnings. Yeah, it's a you know, listen, it's a good question. Um, I think we're going to continue to see both social pressure for wage inflation and actual almost labor strike. The question will be, are we going to have a one off jump? Are we taking the eight fifty an hour workers to eighteen fifty an hour, the thirteen dollar an hour workers to twenty five dollars an hour, and get we can get to a new equilibrium? And in that case, it won't be terrible, right? It'll be a one off one off shock, or is it going to be every year? And I think the jury's too it's too early for us to to judge that yet. That's I think what you've got to key on and focus on. It feels to me like the easiest trade, which. I haven't made any money on this. I haven't lost any money as short fixed income. Because if you have a portfolio of equities or crypto or anything that's going up because of all this money, the perfect hedge is to have a massive short fixed income because there's so much convexity in it. If the Fed really screws up and confidence breaks down, you're going to see rates go much, much higher. If the Fed does their job and the economy grows enough for them to then have to nudge rates they're not going to nudge them a little. You're going to end up making money. And if the economy continues to be soft enough that the Fed's going to just keep printing and pumping money, you're going to lose a little on your fixed income. But you can't lose a lot. You're going to make a lot on your assets. And so I can't imagine owning a big asset portfolio without having a monster rate hedge. Yeah, Mike, one of the things that kind of dovetails with that credit spreads, obviously, or you know, the market for securitizations, obviously, are all trade on that. 
the used car market I find fascinating because you and I both traded through obviously the financial crisis and homes went out the door. Funny, people pay their cars in subprime before they pay their homes because they need their cars to go to work. But we're seeing unsustainable things. And Dan and I argue all the time about if inflation is transitory or not. One area for certain, I think, where it is, is used car prices. And so those cars are being financed right now to subprime consumers again. Here we go again. And the securitization market is eating them up for now. But to your point, where you should focus on, not not telling you where you should focus, but I'm saying one of the areas is obviously used car prices and used car financing. Yeah, listen, you know, we had a supply chain, you know, shut down because of it. You know, people were grasping for cars to drive, right? You needed more cars because no one wanted a carpool because of COVID and all these other reasons. And so it was a supply demand imbalance. I don't think it's a permanent shift. It does worry me. Like if I was a little bit less focused on crypto and not so busy, instead of just hedging with euro dollars and long bonds, I'd be hedging with credit spreads because I think you're probably right. They're probably great, great short rate opportunities. I'd be able to call my friend Boaz Weinstein and figure out what the, the simplest, you know, spreads to put on because that's unsustainable. And we will see, we'll see fallout like we always did. You know, it's a little bit like the housing market in 08, right? It crashed and people started stop building houses. And so you had a, and right now I think housing is going to continue to go higher because we had a housing deficit. The one thing I know about cars is they can come online really quick. So Michael, you know, I would submit the Fed has become a slave to the market. In October 2018, Jerome Powell just started. He basically said, I'm paraphrasing, we're going to basically be on autopilot here in terms of tapering. We're going to start to raise rates from October to December of 2018. The market went down 19.9%. So again, I think they've become a total slave to the market. That's why we find ourselves at all-time highs. In terms of the stock market, does anything stick out to you here that's interesting or you think it's so overvalued that you'd actually consider going the other way? No, listen, I think, God, I'm going to shoot myself for saying it, but what did Stephen Prince, or not, what was his Prince, the CEO of Citibank? You keep Indiana, dancing he, until the music stops or something yeah, like that, right? Yeah, uh, you know, luckily for guys that sit in desks like mine, you can stay long, and then when the world cracks, you can get out, and you can hedge with futures, and you can turn in reverse. And so it's not as hard as mom and dad with, with more stable portfolios. As long as... The Fed is buying $120 billion of securities every month. It's hard to see why stocks are going down. And they're getting more and more expensive. You know, stock market as a percent of GDP is 40% past the Buffett warning zones. And so there's red lights on. But if I look at the charts, if I look at the flows, if I look at where money's coming, it feels like it's going to go higher. It doesn't mean you need to participate. You can go to the sidelines, but it's too dangerous to be big short yet. You can you can short credit spreads. Maybe you can maybe buy some puts, but to start selling the S&P. Now, listen, the S&P will be the last or the U.S. market will be the last long. If you look at the Nikkei, the S&P that I think outperformed the Nikkei by like 15 percent this year in, in, the, in the last two months uh, just devoured it. If you look at Chinese stocks, right, U.S. tech versus China's tech, I've never seen a chart like that. Ninety odd percent. And so we are seeing cracks in other markets. But in all great bull markets, it always ends with less and less breath, more and more concentration. And, and so I, I think the S&P still goes higher. Doesn't that concentration you just mentioned, I mean, you think about the S&P, you think about that outperformance you just mentioned, the NASDAQ, you know, you have five stocks that make up nearly 25% of the weight of the S&P 500. Those same five stocks make up nearly 45% of the weight of the NASDAQ 100. The relative outperformance, is, let's just say to China Tech, because, you know, if we look back a couple of years ago, I mean, people were more bullish on Tencent, on Alibaba than they might have been on their U.S. counterparts. So does that concentration worry a little bit, Mike? And, and do we find ourselves with a level of complacency here that is reminiscent of, of other times past when we couldn't in the argument was Tina? You know, we, we've been in this rate environment before. We've been in, you know, this just really easy monetary policy. But so what, I, what I would tell you, which makes things more difficult for all of us. None of us have ever been in an environment when the central bank and the treasury department are one. We grew up with a framework of independent central banking, of this idea that there was this counterbalance. And we've never seen deficits like this. We've never seen $120 billion a month, a month of buying. And so it makes me question my classic risk management tools and have the humility to say, 
I think so, but I'm going to literally stay close and not know. So I'm watching. My instinct is, you know, if you had told me crypto was going to do what it did, or even my own stock, like I lacked the imagination at one point to think crypto could go as high as it did, as far as it did. And it took me about six weeks after I said it out loud to really start believing it post COVID. When I saw what they were doing, I was like, the whole world changed. And I think the response to COVID really changed our investing horizon. I don't know how long it lasts, but as long as we continue to flood the world with as much liquidity, we're in an environment that we've never been in, that we've never traded or invested in. And so how expensive can expensive get is a crazy question. If you had told me that Cardano, which is some cryptocurrency that I can, for as far as I can tell, no one uses for you know utility like they would Ethereum, it's not building the future on it. It might one day is an $80 billion ecosystem. I would have told you you're smoking hashish or more. And, you know, we've changed the idea of value. If you look at GameStop, if you look at that whole meme stock world, people are creating value because money doesn't have as much value. And so I've got a million dollar LeBron James rookie card that's now worth three million. Uh, you're seeing NFTs trade at crazy prices. And so it's all over the world. We're redetermining what value is. That's probably unsustainable, but I don't know what shuts it off. It's not like a, a hose of money coming out, right? It's a gigantic fire hose, which is like, you know, 14 inches wide, blasting at, you know, record speed. Mike, I don't want to go down this path necessarily and give our ages out. Obviously, everyone can, the four of us add up to over 200. That being said, things go in cycles because generations come and go. So the last one that we really saw, forget about the global financial crisis, that was unique, was the dot-com bubble. And with the dot-com bubble, you know, it was 20 something, 21 years ago, right? So you figure the average age of the trader, let's say, would have to have been at least 23 years old then. So there, there's a new generation here. And what I'm seeing is not necessarily the top heavy names that are controlling the S&P and the NASDAQ 100. It really is these names are now selling off on good news. You're seeing a lot of like mid cap, large cap names selling off. And, and you see investors like, I don't get it. I got to buy the dip. But they're buying a dip into a momentum ending cycle. It feels like the momentum is ending underneath us right now. I agree with you. I think we're in the last chapter here. I just don't know how long the last chapter can go because you do see once a stock breaks, it breaks. I had the CEO of one of Robinhood's competitors in the office a couple of days ago. European based, big. And he said, what's so interesting is every time they sign up a new customer, they buy the same stocks. It used to be only Tesla. Now it's GameStop first, Tesla second, right? And so these new young retail, as, as money gets moved from baby boomers to millennials and to Gen Z, this retail frenzy of, of ideas and memes and Tesla, and I'm hoping Galaxy. <laughs> It's interesting. The first stock they buy is GameStop. He said all their customers. And so I do think we're in a very strange world. And you're right. Stock cracks. They're not bouncing straight back, but you're seeing the, the big guys just power along. Now that you brought up Robinhood, I mean, do you think it's good for the markets, bad for the markets, un unfair to certain investors? I don't think unfair. Listen, I think as a country, we do a horrific job of financial market education, right? We don't teach it in high school. We don't teach it in middle school. We don't teach it in college. Um, and so I think Robin Hood and others like it are providing a service to introduce people early on in their life to how markets work. I think there needs to be more education, more education, more education. I don't think everybody should be an investor. Advisors, investment banks have a huge purpose in this world, right? Doctors should doctor. Artists should create, uh, you know, long haul truck drivers should, should drive. It doesn't mean they shouldn't have a knowledge of the market, but there should be special specialty, right? I, I would rather trust someone who really knows what they're doing with their money than just YOLOing. And so part of the froth around Robinhood is, isn't great, but introducing people to financial markets early on, introducing to, to how markets work is probably a net good thing. You know, it's interesting. Warren Buffett used to make jokes about the bid ass spread, right? How much Wall Street makes, and he wasn't going to trade. He was long, and he, how much he saved every year. There was that famous book, Where are the Customers' Yachts? Where's JP Morgan's yacht? And there's Merrill Lynch's yacht. And the kid says, Well, where are the customers' yachts? And they all laughed at him. Uh, the customers lost all their money trading. I worry a little bit about that 
you know, once this bull market ends, we're going to have lots of people like, what the hell just happened to me? And so I guess I'm torn. I think we need a lot more education and finances. I, I would tell you, there's probably not two in a hundred people in America that know what a yield curve is. There's probably not 40% of the Congress that know what a yield curve is. That's shocking, but I've spent time. And so we should have a generic education in certainly in high school and then a little bit more in college. So Mike, stop me if you heard this one. Alex Karp, Joe Lonsdale, Nathan Gettings, and Peter Thiel walk into a room and they decide the best thing they can do with $51 million is buy gold bars. What the F is going on there before we get into the crypto conversation? I don't get it. I don't get it. Listen, I think gold is a decent asset. Crypto's way outperformed it because it's new and gold is old. I think if you really have a hyperinflation or even worry about it, gold will do fine. It's a hard asset. I'd rather buy real estate than gold. Uh, I just bought a new house in New Orleans. If you guys ever want to get down there for some drinks. <laughs> but I, I don't dislike gold as an asset. Uh, there's more exciting things to do right now for me. All right. So, so Mike, when you were just a macro investor before crypto was a thing, you kept a pretty low profile, at least as it relates to the media. Like I said earlier, we got to know you when you went big into crypto. Talk to us about that transition. How did you get involved in it? And, and why do you think um, this is the, the macro asset of, let's say, the next century? Well, listen, it's a, it's a really important week to be talking about crypto in a lot of ways. I had my to all all hands call today with our company, which is growing like a weed. We'll be 450 people by the time we close our merger with BitGo. And I told them I've never been more optimistic. I think three big things happened this week. I'm going to answer your question and go backwards. Walmart, Amazon both posted help wanted signs for crypto engineers, crypto, you know, crypto expertise. Two, two of the big retail companies, the two most powerful retail companies in the world said, OK, we're getting in. Pretty much that signifies to me that everybody's in. Everyone's got to figure out. They all understand now that there will be a new architecture. It won't maybe completely replace the architecture, but a portion of the financial market architecture, if not a large portion, is going to be blockchain based. We are moving from bank accounts to wallets on phones. And so you had that plus the fact that the whole transportation bill almost got sidetracked by a tiny little poison pill that the White House, i.e. Treasury, was trying to slip in so they could regulate crypto. And on a sleepy weekend, every senator got deluged by phone calls from small holders to influential big holders, Jack Dorsey and Elon Musk tweeting and calling senators. And for the first time, Washington heard crypto roar. And they realized, oh, shit, there are 60 million American crypto holders that are single issue voters all of a sudden. And so the constituency that we have in Washington, even though they end up passing uh, that provision in the transportation bill, which is a really crap provision for crypto, crypto rallied because everyone knew they're going to have to change it. Everyone knew that this is now a real industry. And so I think for employees like mine, their career opportunities de-risk. We have to execute. We have to execute like crazy or we're not going to do great. But the idea that, oh, you're a knucklehead for joining this industry, that, that's, that's, that story is gone. Uh, if I look at my analyst class or my summer analyst class, I couldn't get a job in this place. They are the smartest kids from the best places. And so I couldn't be more optimistic. Like, how did I get into it? Crypto is macro. It, it was a, a generational move. It was a reaction to the financial crisis in 08, right? The Bitcoin white paper was written in 09 when they saw JP Morgan almost go bankrupt and Morgan Stanley almost go bankrupt and, you know, the Federal Reserve deciding who lives and who doesn't live. And there was a sense of uncertainty. There was a sense of unfairness, bailing out the rich guys at the expense of the poor guys. And so it was a reaction where people said, I don't trust the center. It was a big middle finger to the center. It was Gen Z subconsciously and millennials saying, you know what? Why do I keep listening to the goddamn baby boomers? In 30 years since they've been in charge of our country, they've run up debts that they can't repay. 30 years ago, the average American was 30 pounds lighter. So they've turned us into a bunch of porkers. We are 30 pounds heavier on average, men and women, in the last 30 years. 
30 years ago, 17% of children and 17% of seniors lived under the poverty line. Today, 17% of children and 3% of seniors live under the poverty line. What the hell does that mean? It means the grandparents ate the apple before they gave it to their grandkids. Uh, oh, they polluted the country and the world, right? We've got global warming. And so if you're a young person, you're like, why in the hell am I listening to these people? Why do we keep electing Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump and Richard Simmons? What's really interesting is Trump, Bush, and Clinton were born the same year, 75 years old. They've had 20 years, that one birth year. You're supposed to get one to be in charge. And so the crypto revolution was like, enough. We're going to rebuild the system in a fairer way, in a more egalitarian way. We're going to create our own means of exchange. The, the genius of crypto, to make it simple, is if the internet allowed us to have access to information for free. Yesterday, I found out that the GDP of Kenya was $95 billion. It took me one second. I just Googled it. When we were young, we'd have to, got to go to the library and look up Encyclopedia Britannica or buy them, right? And so the internet made information free. The blockchain revolution is going to allow you to charge for content, to charge for IP, to charge for the information that deserves to be charged for. So it's going to be the exchange of value. And once we start exchanging value, all the rules change. Music, right? It cuts out the middleman. It's a peer-to-peer -peer system. And so... What people are waking up to is this was not just about Bitcoin and is Bitcoin beanie babies or not beanie babies. This is about really building a new architecture that is better, right? That's transparent. We would not have had a mortgage crisis if all banks' balance sheets were, were transparent, right? The DeFi protocols, things like Aave, you can look online and see exactly the leverage they have, exactly how many loans they have, exactly who the loans are to. And me and you aren't going to look because we're too lazy. There's going to be AI programs that actually look and monitor this stuff and governance tokens. And so there's this amazing new world coming. And I think people are waking up to it. That goes way beyond Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is really easy to understand. It's a report card on how the Central Bank and the Ministry of Finance, how the Central Bank and the Treasury are doing. It's a report card on how the government is dealing with our finances, we buy it because we're like, oh, shit, they're going to debase the dollar. I pray they don't debase the dollar that fast because then we have a breakdown in civil society, right? I pray that Janet Yellen wins with this 3%. But even so, the dollar's going to get a little weaker. You've said in the past that the price of Bitcoin serves as a you know, you know, report card on the Fed. I'm going to ask you what that grade is right now. I think I know the answer. But one other thing just in general is I know Bitcoin and crypto people they want government to a degree. They don't want them intervening too much. They want them a little bit. And I say that because I know you've applied for Bitcoin futures ETF and you want someone like a Ginzo that can go in and protect people. So give me the grade. Tell me how much you want the government to be involved at all. Yeah. Listen, I think we're getting a C right now. A D and an F you start feeling like you're Venezuela or maybe even a C plus. We have very competent people in the civil, civil service jobs in America. Janet Yellen has high integrity. Jerome Powell has high integrity. They believe what they're doing is right. They have a brutally hard job. They've inherited from politicians who have a lot less high integrity, this mess, and they're doing the best they can with it. Will they be able to land the plane and, and get the A? I think doubtful. I asked Ray Dalio, and he said he can't comprehend saying this, but he thinks the only way out is at one point a U.S. debt restructuring. He thought the window was so short. Now, I'm not Ray Dalio is not the oracle, but he's a smart guy. But so when all the macro thinkers start getting worried, like I would rather bet on Stan Druckenmiller than I would on Janet Yellen. And Druckenmiller's worried, right? Worried about the dollar, worried about inflation. And so there are enough smart guys that I that have followed these things and bet on them for a long time that it's hard to feel confident right now. And so that's where my C comes from. Listen, there's part of crypto in the constituents crypto that are pure libertarians. And I was like, I hate libertarians. I like to eat them for lunch. By being in government, you give up some rights. There's, there's a concession to be in government, to be in society, right? I just can't walk over and smash you in the head with a, you know, my fist just because I want to. That's not, that's not allowed. There's, there's, there's rules of engagement. And we're going to have some rules of engagement with crypto, and so the key is to get the right rules of engagement. And 
I have a lot of faith. I, you know, I know Gary Gensler well. He is smart. He's ambitious. He tried to just sneak in and he wants to regulate. He's fair about be there. I want to be the sheriff. And I think he thinks he knows best. I think this is such a young industry that that generation and quite frankly, our generation should have some humility and go slow with regulation. It takes so much work for me just to keep up with what's going on each week. So when I go on TV, I don't feel like a fool. The NFT space didn't exist four months ago. It's a huge business today, right? We helped set up Candy Digital. It's raising money at a billion and a half dollars. That was an idea five months ago. It's going to change the way sports fans interact with their their clubs, uh, how they buy collectibles. And so we definitely don't want to stop innovation. And all the politicians don't think they do, right? And so I think... What was promising about 10 days ago was people were put on notice that people care a lot about this industry. I mean, I think about our own company, right? We'll have 450 people by the end of the year with an average salary over $200,000. Those are good jobs. That's what America wants to create. And I'm one of 100 companies in crypto. And so this is a growth industry that's just getting started. Mike, just quickly on Tether, you mentioned how transparent Crypto can can be, but it can also be a little bit murky. You're going to have bad, you're gonna have bad actors in every industry, especially when it's new like this. What are your thoughts on on something like that and how it can impact, you know, just the industry in general? If I think of Occam's Razor, right, what's the most obvious? The guys at Tether have so much to lose; they're probably not cheating. They try to be transparent. I think they have a lot of Chinese commercial paper, and let's hope that Chinese commercial paper pays well. Uh, Tether created a non-bank bank that's not regulated. And people that are participating with Tether know that. It's pretty clear. Tether tells you what they have invested in broadly. It's not fully transparent. You know, it would be bad for the ecosystem, but not catastrophic if there was a run on Tether. There are lots of alternative stable coins today, right? The Terra Luna Network's got one uh, that's blowing up right now. Circle and Coinbase have USDC. That's over $25 billion. I hope what the U.S. central bank does is say, hey, we're going to sanction these eight projects that all basically have to keep the reserves that back the stable coin at a Fed bank. Because then there'll be real confidence. Like USDC keeps all their money at U.S. Bancorp. So there's no, there's no murkiness. Why would I own Tether if I could own USDC? I wouldn't, you know? And so good actors will, will migrate to one. People use Tether now because it's most likely good. And it is most likely good. It really is. Again, it would make so little sense when you have such a huge, their exchange and their stable coin. It's such a huge money-making machine to try to get cute. So Mike, Coinbase on their Q2 call, they talked about Ethereum fees from trading were greater than that of Bitcoin the first time ever here. Give us your take. We know you're a very early Ethereum investor. We also, um, I've heard you say recently that really the best use case for Bitcoin right now is a store of value. And we talked a little bit about gold and talked about the debasement of the dollar. So just real quickly, will Ethereum overtake the market cap of Bitcoin at some time soon? And just give us a sense. You mentioned NFTs. You mentioned DeFi. These are all applications being built on top of Ethereum. We know interoperability is going to be a big, big theme going forward. But uh, give us a sense for for one versus the other. I honestly don't know. So Bitcoin is pretty easy for me to have a valuation framework. I know gold's $11 trillion. I know Bitcoin's $900 billion. We're going to go from $900 billion towards $11 trillion over some period of time. And it's not going to go in a straight line. It's going to go with adoption. I think it's won the lane for institutions as a store of value in the crypto world. There's other stores of value. You can buy Dogecoin if you want. But for this idea of it's got its value because we say it has its value, right? Just like gold, I think Bitcoin's going to win and head up. Ethereum is fighting and leading what we'll call the level one solutions, the blockchains to be built on top of. Uh, Chris Dixon, who's a brilliant writer, just did a great tweet storm and called it like it's the app store. It's a great way to think about it, right? What's going to be built on top of the app store? It's DeFi, it's NFTs, it's this whole world. What's the TAM of that? What's the TAM of being the currency of culture? 
I, I dubbed that. That was a Mike Novogratz dub. Ethereum is the currency of culture. And so it's, it's much harder to tell. It's going to get valued as a network effect. Think of how Facebook, the more people to use it, the more shit that's built on top of it. What's different between Bitcoin and Ethereum is Bitcoin's finished. Doesn't need to be fixed. It works today the way it's going to work in 10 years. Ethereum is growing like crazy, but there's big changes that need to happen for it to live up to its potential. It's got to be able to process faster and faster, more amounts of information in a decentralized way. And so we have this really interesting experiment going on. There is six or seven good layer one protocols. The Ethereum is really the only one that's really decentralized. But if I decentralize it less and make it faster, it's a lot easier for people to use. In the long run, will consumers care? Will regulators care? Those questions, no one knows the answer to. And so when I invest, I have a lot of Ethereum, but I also have Terra Luna, I have Solana, I've got Polkadot, we've got some Rune coin, which is to try to make these chains interoperable. And so I warn listeners that this part of the market should feel more like venture. Even though the companies are getting bigger, there are huge numbers at stake. The valuations are so high because this is going to transform the way shit happens. And so the possibility of this monster ecosystem really does exist. It will happen. It's just what concoction or what connection of all these, these protocols is going to win. No one's fighting with Bitcoin for store of value for real. And so I, you know, I moved my portfolio around. I started the year with 70% Bitcoin and 30% Ethereum. We've recently have been more like 40% Bitcoin and 60% Ethereum and its competitors you know, throw DeFi in there. I don't know if there's a there's a right or wrong answer. I see them as different bets. A lot of the DeFi bets are interesting because they can feel like equities. So you can actually look at the revenue they're generating and how the governance token is being burnt or being stopped or giving a synthetic revenue. And you can say, huh, growth, this, PE. And so things like sushi seems cheap. Mike, there are a lot of things we could talk about. Just briefly talk to me about the bail project. Yeah, listen, I... But five years ago, four years ago, stumbled really into the criminal justice reform space. When you look at our system of justice in America, from who gets arrested, from why we cage people for certain crimes and not for others, uh, how we process them, who gets bail and who doesn't get bail, what parole looks like. When you take it the whole space, you literally get sick to your stomach. When I took 30 people to Germany and Norway to look at their system and their prisons, and you'd give Germany a 92 out of 100 and the Norway a 98 out of 100 on the ethos and how they operate and the humanity there, you'd give the United States not a 60, but a 12. We are as bad as anywhere in the world. It is, it's, it's embarrassing. It's unjust. It's uneconomic. It's infuriating. And so I started with the bail project because I met the woman who ran it and she made the pitch. And I was like, oh my God, you had me at hello. Uh, Robin Steinberg, she's just a badass woman. And, you know, it's really a simple story. Tonight, close to half a million people will go to bed in a dangerous, dirty jail cell, having been arrested but not convicted of a crime. You're innocent until proven guilty in this country, unless you're poor. Any one of us who got in a fight, who stole something, who got a DUI. Well, DUI, they might make us spend one night in jail. All the rest of the stuff were bailed out within hours. For 50% of America who can't afford a $500 dental bill, they're staying in jail two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. In the first 21 days in jail, 50% of prison rape and 50% of prison suicide happens, right? You go in there. Prison is actually far more organized than jail. For people that know jail is one year and under, prison is one year over. And so most people in Rikers, 95%, haven't been convicted of a crime. They're waiting trial. And they're waiting trial and waiting trial. And the DA says, just plead guilty and I'll let you go. 98% of cases are pled out in this country. There's not a system of justice. And, you know, they're predominantly poor black and brown families. And then they've got a criminal record. And so we said, this doesn't make any sense. And so the bail project just pays people's bail. They all come back to, you know, bail was supposed to make sure you come back. 
we had in New York had over a 98% return rate. And so we also then tell the story and have tried to change the rules. And it's working. The criminal justice reform, it's a bipartisan movement, right? I work with the Koch family on many of things. And I think it's bipartisan because America believes in second chances. Like we're a country of redemption. Shit, if I didn't have second chances, I certainly wouldn't be here right now. And I think deep down, we believe in justice and fairness and the system we have, however we got it. And you can you can tell the story of starting from slavery to mass incarceration. However we got here, when you look at it, if I took you there and gave you proximity, you would literally be embarrassed for our country. We have four people that have been formerly incarcerated people that work here in the galaxy offices. Smartest, nicest, most decent people. One guy spent 23 years in jail. One guy spent 16 years in jail. You don't spend that much time in jail unless you're accused of something really, or you're convicted of something really shitty. I'd let these guys babysit my kids. People change. Part of the beauty of being human. And so it's become a huge part of my life. It's become a monster part of my philanthropy. And if it wasn't for crypto being so busy, I think I would do it full time. Mike, I appreciate you spending time with us. I want to be respectful of yours. Check out Mike Novogratz at Novogratz on Twitter. The Bell Project is unbelievable. On behalf of Dan and Danny, I want to thank you for joining us on the tape today. Thank you, Michael. Thanks once again to CME Group for sponsoring this episode of On the Tape. If you liked what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find our show and we love hearing from you. And we also want to hear from you via email at onthetape at riskreversal.com any time of the day. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at On The Tape Pod, and we'll see you next time. On The Tape is a Risk Reversal media production. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All opinions expressed by me, Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, and any other participants are solely our opinions and should not be relied upon for specific investment decisions. (laughs) 